Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectors, and welcome to episode 103 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. If the audio sounds a little bit different, that's because I'm in a Vegas hotel room and it is the uh, last day, or yesterday was the last day of the WMG Business Master Class of Writing and Publishing workshop, uh, which I was one of the instructors at, and I am uh, just about to pack up and get ready to head to the airport and head home, and that's why this episode is going to be all about the 15 top quotes I wrote down from the workshop there's so much information, five days of, of um, bombardment of information. Uh, if you remember last year around this time, I did a special episode which was talking about how to deal with a fire hose of information, and that's from a panel discussion that Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush and I did about triaging all of the information you were getting in. And I thought one of the ways that I was going to triage the information that I took in myself because yes even though I'm an instructor here I'm also learning lots of stuff both from the other panelists and presenters as well as from the folks who are sitting in the audience lots of amazing and brilliant people there as well as the lunches and dinners and breakfasts etc I was having or the hallway conversations or the evening suite conversations I was having with the authors so that's what this episode is about But as I mentioned, I'm in a Vegas hotel room, so the acoustics are not as good as they should be, even though I did bring my Blue Yeti mic with me, so I do have a a decent microphone, but there's construction going on. I'm not sure if you can hear it uh, out the window behind me. I've done what I can to try to muffle the sound and turn off the fan in the room and all that stuff. But this is going to be a relatively brief introduction. Just going to mention uh, a couple of things and then jump right into the main content of this episode. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a way for authors and small publishers, or even large publishers, to get their audiobooks into a broad global market. About 30 or so different retailers and library systems, and it's continuing to grow. Pay attention to some new announcements, which will be coming from Findaway Voices, on yet more places that you can distribute your audio. And the way that you distribute your, your audio with Findaway Voices is... With choice, you can choose price. You can choose the price, I should say. And uh, except for obviously uh, with a platform like Audible that sets its own price, but you can choose where you distribute to and where you don't distribute to. You can choose whether or not you want to just upload your own files that you've already had professionally produced, or you can choose to work with one of their narrators that they have from thousands of narrators around the world and you'll get a project manager assigned to helping you assist with the process. So whether you want to DIY all the way or whether you need assistance, it's definitely worth checking out Findaway Voices. And you can learn more about them over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. In terms of a quick personal update, I am in a couple of story bundles right now. You can check the story bundles over at storybundle.com. And for the next, I am recording this just to let you know on Wednesday, October 30th. And that's uh, this will be going out into the podcast feed later on the 30th, at least in Eastern time. But uh, in less than 29 days, the Nano Writing Tools Bundle which is curated by Kevin J. Anderson, is um, going to be available for, for a great deal. You can check it out at StoryBundle slash Nano. And you've got some great content there. You've got Kevin's book on dictating uh, books. You've got Productivity for Authors by Joanna Penn. You have Rock Solid Newsletters by Andrea Pearson. You have Chris Fox's 5,000 Words Per Hour. You have Christine Catherine Rush's How to Make Money, a Freelancer Survival Guide. You have so many other great books. You've got a collection of essays, How I Published and What I Learned Along the Way, edited by 
Lynn Worthen. You've got a couple uh, books for me, The Seven P's of Publishing Success and Killing It on Kobo. You have so many other books as well as access to a lecture, online lecture from Dean Wesley Smith and access to Judo, uh, a discount off of Judo for digital publishing for a DIY experience. Amazing books, perfectly themed for Nano Rimo, and uh, that will be available at storybundle.com slash nano. And the other one that I'm in is uh, another one that is, uh, this one's curated by Dean Wesley Smith, and it's fiction. It's the Saving the World Bundle, and it's themed off of a fiction river anthology called How to Save the World. F- fiction River is, a, is an anthology uh, series basically a quarterly series, and the theme was how to save the world. And so all of the books involved in that are based on that theme. And you can get a whole bunch of different books from Lisa Silverthorne, from Robert J. McCarter, from Christine Catherine Rush, and Dean Wesley Smith, and Ron Collins, and J.F. Penn, and as well as a bundle uh, that I put together called um, Nocturnal Saves, which are basically five stories of heroes in, in different ways, guises, and forms. And that is available at storybundle.com slash action. And that actually ends in about 15 days from the time that you hear this. So those are two of the things that I've been involved with. And I am going to be involved with NaNoWriMo very soon. In just a couple days, I'm going to get started on that. And I'll keep you guys updated and curious to hear what you're doing for NaNoWriMo, if you're doing anything for NaNoWriMo. But that's enough for the brief personal update as well as the introduction. Let's get right into the main content for this episode. As I mentioned, I'm here in Vegas at the WMG Business of Publishing and Writing Masterclass, which is a series of business workshops that are run by Christine Catherine Rush and Dean Wesley Smith. And for this particular workshop, because I've been to a number of them over the years, and every year there's always changes and there's always additions. There's some core content, but there's always new things to add and, and a focus. And so one of the overarching themes from the past five days was diversification. And the quote that, and I can't remember who said this, uh, probably Dean or Chris, is it's better to make a little bit of money from a lot of sources than to make a lot of money from one or two places. And that's an important thing as we think about our future as creative people, as storytellers, and we think about the different ways that we can earn a living from our writing. And and that's sort of a, not a bit of a mind shift, but this particular class brought in a lot of information about licensing and licensing your IP, and that was a, a, con, a constant theme for this particular year, and not just being reliant on uh, single sources. So that was really, really important. And as I briefly mentioned earlier, what I'm doing is rather than talk about all the different panels and all the different discussions, because that basically could take five days, because <laughs> it was five full days of information here, I thought... Um, it, when you come to a conference like this, there's so much information that's flying at you, and you make lists. I have uh, different notepads and, and paper I brought, as well as the little notepads that are provided by the, the conference or the, the hotel, and I have probably 30 different sheets with scribblings on it, whether it was a sheet I was writing on while I was on a panel, because the other panelists say really cool things, and I make notes of them, or whether I'm in the back of the room and I'm writing down what people are saying, uh, what, what good questions people are asking, whatever. And one of the things I did this year is I, I would write down a quote because I, I look for different ways to, when I finish uh, a conference like that, you decompress, take a breath, and then look at the information and how you may apply that information to your own uh, writing world, writing business, and your own business plans, etc. And so what I thought would be important was this year, just write down quotes and say, okay, so-and-so said this. I'm not, I may not give the context. I may give the context, but I'm going to say, here's the quote. Here's what I got from it. So there's going to be basically 15 mini reflections on really cool things that were said during this conference. Number one, Dean Wesley Smith. It's not a book. It's an idea. A book is just one part of the larger idea. For this, I'm going to pause in my reflection. I'm going to read number two, and I'm going to reflect on both of them at the same time, because this really sets up the scene for the mind shift change. 
that was part of this conference. Number two, Christine Catherine Rush. Mindset shift. Not how to make money off my idea or story, but what are the ways that people can enjoy that story the most? So considering what Dean said and what Chris said, it's related to a handout that they offered. A new way of thinking. And what this is, is in a nutshell in, in the handout, is at the very top you have the person who is a brand. You have your company, or imprint if, if you prefer, but imprint is only when you think about it specific to books. But So you have a company that is a brand. And then you have multiple ideas. And each idea is an intellectual property or IP, but it's also its own brand. Uh, and there can be crossover brands, there can be series brands, etc. So there can be connected ideas, and there can be standalone ideas, and they can and they can all represent a different style of brand. I'll use an example for me. I mean, I have a brand as an author of True Ghost Stories, and I've done a bunch of books with Dundurn, and that's a particular series of ideas that are all connected yet standalone, but they're all part of a particular brand with a different core audience. I have fiction and different fiction and different books that are standalone books or ones that should be you know the beginning of a series at the very least they're a different brand and each brand is unique to its own audience but within that single idea or that brand a book is just one of them it's one of the ways you leverage an ip you license the rights to a publisher or you self-publish etc or some combination of the two because you can license as we saw in episode 100, and it does happen, you can license the print rights to a publisher and keep digital rights, or maybe sell audio-only rights, or, or even split that up by territory. So it's not as simple as just book. And that book can break into multiple things. But then there's video. There's audio. There's merchandise. There's games. There are different ways, as Chris said, that people can enjoy the story or the idea the most. And that's a huge mindset shift that basically set the stage for the rest of this conference. And it's something I want you to think about as a writer, as a creative person. It's not a book, it's an idea. A book is just part of the larger idea. And you have lots of ideas. It's a mindset shift in thinking about ways that people can enjoy the story which harkens back to David Gogren's The Reader Journey, focusing on the reader journey rather than the writer journey. And and that's uh, interesting to consider those things. As you look at your brand as a person, your brand as a company, and the brands of the different ideas that you have. Lauren Coleman, who is an author and the owner of Catalyst Games, conjured up a, a Japanese quote. And the quote is, fall down seven times, get up eight. That's persistence. That is continuing to work at it. That is having patience. That is believing. And that is continuing to work hard. And that is so, so critical, is to continue to get back up and to continue working at it. Kevin J. Anderson, when you get success... Start planning for not success. This is an indication. Kevin's been in the industry for a long, long time, and he's seen the ups and downs and the waves of both traditional and indie publishing. When you are successful, when you are having success, plan ahead. Put some money aside. Plan for a time when things aren't going so well, when life gets in the way. Kevin and Rebecca had a very challenging personal year, which meant they couldn't write as much. They actually had to delay some of the projects. There was a lot of personal stuff going on with family. And so there are times when a contract comes through or when the royalties or the monthly uh, self-published income is high, make sure you, you budget for that rainy day because there will be successful times, there will be a lot of flow, and there will be unsuccessful times. How do you balance those things out, particularly as a freelancer in many ways, who's relying not on a base income from a job but income that's coming from your writing and all of those writing properties and ideas that you have out there chuck heinzelman who is a writer but also the owner of bundle rabbit one big fear is i grow too fast 
Chuck was talking specifically about Bundle Rabbit and talking about cash flow and the way that uh, he actually pays authors on a particular cycle. And there are sometimes in that cycle where the flow out is greater than the flow in or comes just before the, the flow in. So he can consistently pay writers at the same time, no matter where the money's coming from, from the different retailers. And that's a critical thing to think about. But if he grows too fast, if suddenly the sales um, quadruple or are 10 times what they were the month before, that's a big negative cash flow that happens before the positive cash flow. So that's an example of really fast success. But there may be different things that happen to you. There's an old thought that if you got everything you wish on the same day, would you be able to handle it? Sometimes so much stuff is coming in that uh, it actually overwhelms the processes you've built or the scale of the processes you built. And that's a critical thing to think about. Yeah, we all want to grow. We all want to succeed. But sometimes succeeding too fast can actually be a detrimental thing for the processes that we've built. And that's something to consider. Number six, Christy and Catherine Rush. Measuring cash flow isn't something you do once. It's something you do on an ongoing basis. This is just a reminder that you don't just check things once. You're actually constantly monitoring it, constantly looking at it, constantly making adjustments as necessary as one of the ways to stay on track when you're managing your writing business. It's similar to something you do with, with carpentry. You know, you measure twice and cut once. But cash flow, uh, you know, the, the, the money you're spending and the income that you're getting is going to be changing as the market changes. So you can't just, I mean, you can set a plan and plan for things. But as things change, you have to readjust it. And that's really, really critical for success in a financial way as a writer. Number seven, Kevin J. Anderson. If you want lightning to strike, you have to plant a lot of lightning rods. This harkens back to uh, Kevin's popcorn theory of success, and it kind of goes back to uh, Lauren's comment on fall down seven times, get up eight. You're going to try a lot of things, you're going to experiment in a lot of ways, and uh, some of them are going to hit, and some of them aren't going to hit. It's part of working hard, it's part of persisting, it's part of experimenting, it's part of trying new things. Lightning strikes, and it may strike where you've set a lightning rod, but chances are if you set a lot of lightning rods, you're more likely to have the lightning strike your rod. A weird uh, analogy, but because nobody wants to be hit by lightning, <laughs> but uh, it kind of goes back to the overarching theme for this conference, which was diversification and, and earning income from different sources, right? So maybe it's not a giant lightning strike, maybe it's a small pulse of electricity, if I wanna stick with that analogy, but it's that multiple options, multiple opportunities, because you never know where that's gonna come from. And it also speaks in many ways to the concept of publishing wide and being available in many different places, because you never know where those readers are going to be showing up. Joanna Penn, it's a passion project, but I have a business plan for it. Now, this was Joanna talking about her newer podcast, The Books and Travel, and she is very passionate about writing and travel, and she loves doing research for it. So this this particular podcast is all about interviewing different authors about books or sharing personal stories about her experiences in different parts of the world. And it's part of building this whole new brand for readers, not for writers, who are interested in travel because so much of uh, her writing is based on different wonderful locales that she's experienced uh, and because she loves to travel. So what I love about this is, yeah, she's following a passion. She's doing something that she's just, her entire life, she's been all about exploration and travel. And it's, she's very passionate about it. But she didn't just go into it blindly. She has a business plan. It's a five, ten year plan for this podcast and what it's going to mean for her writing business. She's enjoying it. She's having a great time. She's building a whole new base of, of listeners and readers. And she has a plan for it. So passion plus business plan. Critical thinking. Number nine, Christine Catherine Rush. No keeps you in control of your IP. This is Chris 
Reminding writers to step back, to not have to say yes to everything. Yes, there's amazing opportunities and it's great to explore and try new things, but often remembering the importance of saying no, of not just agreeing to do everything, allows you to remember that this is your IP, this is your intellectual property. You're in control of your intellectual property and it's okay for you not to get into something. It's really, really difficult when somebody's interested in our IP and there is an offer on the table, whether that's an advance from a publisher, whether it's Hollywood knocking on your door, step back and remember it's yours, you're in control of it, and it's okay to say no. Number 10, Marie Whitaker. Marie is the personal assistant to Kevin J. Anderson. She is a writer. She is an associate publisher of Wordfire Press and also the director of Superstars Writing Seminars. I spent a lot of time trying to identify any area in the business, the processes, and the employees where there was a single point of failure. Now Marie's talking about stepping back and looking at the logistics, looking at the processes, looking at the people, looking at the places, and spending some time trying to identify single points of failure. She was referring to... uh, something that had happened in a business where there was a single point of failure and it caused an incredible mess. It caused a a mess that took a long time to dig out of. So she spent a lot of time when she was looking at the business to try to identify those points and, and look at what a plan B could be if that failed. So if this doesn't happen, what does that mean? Is there somebody else who can pick up on that? Or is there some other process that covers for it in the meantime? So thinking about your business, What is the single point of failure? If you are an entrepreneur, a solo author, and and your writing is is creating, well, there's a single point of failure. What happens if you get hit by a bus? What happens if you cannot write for a particular period of time? So you you break your arm and and you can't uh, dictate or, or, or whatever. You can't write. So thinking about those single points of failure and what you're going to plan for. So basically, again, putting that business hat on and thinking long term, rather than just assuming everything is going to be fine all the time. Number 11, Andrea Pearson. In a blurb, cliches actually help let the reader know what the book is about. This is important because often as writers, we try to avoid cliches in our writing, but you have to remember that with the limited time span that people have when they're looking at your book, um, they're looking at the listing on an online retailer, etc., They're going to make a snap decision on the cover and whether or not it's attractive and appeals to them and and essentially appeals to the tropes and the cliches that they already know they love. Um, And similarly, in the book, while the book will be written without using a lot of cliches, the, the branding, the marketing aspect of trying to convince them to pick up the book, sometimes cliches actually help them say, yes, this book is for me. So remember... Cliches are not something you want to use a lot of in your actual writing, but they may be something that works really well in your marketing because marketing is often just cutting to the chase, and that's kind of what cliches do. Number 12, Lauren Coleman. If you're not growing your brand, you're shrinking. This harkens back to the thinking about your IP, your company, your person, your books, your ideas, whatever it is, thinking of that as the brand, and all of it is your brand, and the activities you engage in, the processes you do, the actions you take, if those actions don't lead to growing or expanding your brand, chances are that brand is shrinking. In many ways, it's not all that different than thinking about your ranking and the temperature on different retail sites, if that's an easier way for you to think about it. Number 13, Christine Catherine Rush. Branding is marketing at an advanced level. And that's so true. Again, the focus on brand and the brands of the various things that you bring at the table. Marketing maybe seems more as a tactical maneuver. And brand is more of a strategy. That's one way of thinking about it. Because branding can be an all-encompassing thing, but can also go right down into the details. There's brands for all those levels of your your person, your company, your idea, and then the things that stem out of the idea, whether it's a book, whether it's a movie, whether it's audio, whether it's toys, whether it's uh, some other IP that leverages that idea. So branding is all-encompassing 
and yet can also be very narrow niche. So it's very advanced and it's critical to constantly be thinking about your brand. Number 14, Deidre J. Mana Bratton. Now Deidre is a licensing professional in the Las Vegas area. She actually manages uh, licensing shows uh, in the U.S. here as, as well as around the world. And she reminded authors that people want that experience moment. This is critical as you're thinking about your intellectual property, you're thinking about your brand, and you're thinking about, as Chris mentioned, uh, or I talked about Chris mentioning earlier, is thinking about it from the reader's perspective or how they want to enjoy the idea. And Deidre brings that home by saying people want that experience moment, whether it's experiencing sitting down with a book and just losing themselves in it, whether it's experiencing wearing merchandise that they identify with. So think about somebody who identifies as a a Gryffindor uh, house person from Harry Potter. It's, you know, derived from that IP, that idea from J.K. Rowling, but it's a different sort of thing. People want to feel that experience. They want to be part of it. Another example might be, let's take Star Wars, for example. When, when my son was little, he was uh, into Star Wars. I'm, I'm still into Star Wars. But he got to experience Star Wars in different ways. He got to play with Star Wars Lego. So he got to have little adventures that he built and designed himself. When we were at Disney, we got to go on a Star Wars ride. We got to, he got to train as a Jedi and fight Darth Vader. So there was the idea, the IP, the George Lucas um, series of, of, of movies but there's so many other ways to experience it. There was the Clone Wars cartoon that he watched. There, again, the Lego, again, the physical experiences, the identifying experiences, the shirts and the branding where, you know, um, the, the force is strong in this one, that kind of thing. All that is what Deidre was talking about. People want that experience. So that's where when you're thinking about your brand and your IP and all those ideas and the ways that people can experience them, thinking about that end person and that that's what they want. They want experiences. And that's critical to keep in mind as you're looking at ways to leverage your ideas and your intellectual property. Number 15, Dean Wesley Smith. The only you gotta is you gotta do it your way. This is so critical to remember. I only shared 15 things here, but there were 500 things that came out of this conference. 500 ideas, 500 perspectives, 500 concepts, 500 plans, 500 strategies, 500 branding concepts, etc. You have to remember that there's no one way to do things. There's no one right solution. There's no magic bullet for anything. What you need to do, what's critical, is pay attention and listen and extrapolate the ideas that you're hearing. Even so, think about these 15 ideas. Some of them may have resonated with you. Some of them you may have disagreed with, and that's fine. You listen to them. You consider whether or not they apply to your particular situation. And ideally, you adapt them into something that's going to work specifically for you, specifically for you as the person, the brand, specifically for your company as the brand, specifically for each idea as a brand and all of the different properties that can come out of that idea as their own parts of the brand. You've got to do it your way. I've said this before in the podcast and I did say that uh, close to our closing statements for the conference but in a lot of ways the indie author community can be like a bunch of eight-year-olds playing soccer one kid gets the ball and is on a breakaway with the ball and is having a blast and is successful because they're with the ball and instead of playing their own positions instead of being strategic in their plan all those kids all those eight-year-olds are just swarming and running after that one kid with the ball and they all go all the way across the other side of the field and then someone else gets the ball and it goes the other way and all the kids just swarm along with them and so many of the ways that the indie author community works is there's one kid with the ball and that kid gets the ball and maybe that kid gets the ball and is really really successful but then that kid is selling their ideas for success to all the other kids whose strategy is not necessarily the same 
And because I'm Canadian and because hockey is valuable and because Wayne Gretzky was the greatest hockey player of all time, I try to compare that method of playing the sport to what Gretzky said about why he was such a successful hockey player. And I think a lot of it had to do with patience, practice, and persistence. But he said he skated to where the puck was going to be. Our industry changes. Methodologies change. Ideas change. Different things come in and out, particularly with storytelling. New technologies will emerge that will make changes as well. Consistently thinking about the experiences that your potential readers, the experiences that those who leverage your IP and want to enjoy the stories that you share and the ideas that you have to put out in the world, thinking about them very, very strategically and thinking about the things you're passionate about doing and being consistent to play the position of what you do best and working within that, doing it your way rather than just chasing trends back and forth on a field like those eight-year-olds playing soccer. Those are the things that are important. You need to do it your way. You need to focus on you and your brand and your readers and those people who want to experience the things you create. And keeping that in mind as things shift because things are constantly going to shift. The only you gotta is you gotta do it your way. I think that's an important way to leave this off because you're listening to this podcast. You listen to other podcasts, probably. If you listen to one, you're probably listening to more than one. You go to conferences, you're listening to people, you're paying attention, you're reading books, you're getting inspired. But with every single thing that you take in, you're taking in ideas and you're readapting them for things that suit and work specifically for you. For an example, in my case, Every single idea I have or every single book that I have is unique and has its own unique path to success. Every single maybe series or every single property that you're thinking of has its own unique way. One way might work for this one and another way might work for that one. So it's not even individuals, it's individual projects that you work on. And I want to remind you that we often lose sight. We look at other people and we look at the processes and things that they're doing and they're successful here and I'm not successful here and we fall into this comparisonitis trap but the thing that I think is critical for you to remember is that you are the best person to tell your stories in your way to your readers you're the best person to work that particular idea or that particular IP which is yours and to allow it and to control it You're in control. You decide which publisher you get to sign with. You get to decide which retailers you want to distribute with or which people in the industry that you want to work with or which service providers bring you the most value based on your specific needs for that specific project. You don't have to do everything the same way with every single IP. You have control. You're the best person for that. You know who you can work with, who you can collaborate with that work for you. Some of them may work well, some of them might not work well. You're gonna make mistakes along the way as well. You're gonna learn, you're gonna fall seven times, you're gonna get up eight. I hope you found value in my reflections on 15 of the 500 or so things that I got from this conference. And I hope you're not too overwhelmed with just that. But maybe something that I said, something that I shared, maybe it sparked a different reflection in you. And I love the fact that that sparked a different reflection in you. I might have, I might have gone one way with a, with a, a, something that I heard and something that I repeated that was said, and you went another way, and that's perfectly fine, and I love that. If you're interested in sharing any of the ideas that uh, this podcast sparked, feel free to leave those comments at starkreflections.ca for episode 103. Again, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre. If you find value in this podcast, please feel free to rate it or review it on the podcatcher of your choice, or even better, share it with someone that you think would find value in the reflections that I have on the business of writing and publishing. So again, this is Mark. Thanks for hanging out with me for episode 103. Until next week and next episode, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. 
Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. 